They operate in strictest secrecy, at the cutting edge of Australia's defence. They're creative, unorthodox and comfortable in chaos. For over 50 years, the Australian SAS has put their lives at risk, deep in enemy territory. This is the only television history ever supported by this highly secretive regiment. We take you beyond the stereotypes to reveal the unexpected story of the real people who set out to transform SAS from the ugly duckling of the Australian Army into Australia's force of first choice. insurgency in Asia was spreading. To protect its alliance with America, Australia sent a task force to Vietnam. Its mission was to destroy communist influence in Phoc Thuy province. An SAS squadron would watch the back of this small outnumbered task force and try to locate the elusive VC guerrillas for task force attack. SAS would also engage in counter-revolutionary warfare. Their strategy would be to make the jungle unsafe for the Viet Cong. SAS would use the guerrillas' own tactics against them. On receiving the warning order that we were going on patrol, and that could occur anywhere between one and four or five days, on receiving that warning order, you would cease um, uh, shaving, showering, etc. You would wear the same clothes. So by the time you uh, were ready to be deployed or inserted into the patrol area, you had lost any cosmetic or artificial uh, fragrance whatsoever. So you, you fitted into the environment. Living in the jungle is, is not necessarily the most pleasant experience. Uh, there were a fair number of poisonous snakes ranging from cobras to uh, bamboo vipers and a, and a snake that's very similar to a death adder. Uh, scorpions, uh, spiders. At night the snakes would come down out of the trees to hunt out of the bamboo and you'd hear them hit the ground in a series of dull plops. The jungle had long been the VC's safe haven. But to SAS, the jungle was neutral. SAS patrols became adept at camouflage. One trooper was hiding by a track and a Viet Cong urinated on him without seeing him. He said later that communist urine and capitalist urine tasted the same. We'd just been through a empty enemy camp and uh, it started raining heavily and uh, we stopped and I heard someone cough and I thought it was one of our guys and I turned around to look but uh, in fact it wasn't. It was a uh, VC walking towards me about four metres away. Um, so I raised my rifle slowly and we froze and uh, a little while later we counted about 40 odd VCs all well armed, fresh uniforms. I tried not to make a eye contact with any of the guys because uh, you get a feeling you're being stared at, they might pick up on it. So I stared at their chest, uh, which is where I was going to shoot anyway, so, um, and none of them looked up. I was a scout, and uh, because of my complexion and my uh, greyhound look about me, I guess that um, I used to dress up as uh, an NVA or uh, as the enemy and if we're approaching tracks or camps or things like that, uh, he used to send me in close to uh, to sort of do a, a see what was going on and of course if I was spotted, I could be seen as one of them. SAS converted their rifles illegally to imitate the sound of a heavy machine gun. This often tricked the VC into thinking a small SAS patrol was a big force. 
We took the flash hider off the end of it, which when we fired it, created a, a, a flame that came out the end, probably the size of a large soup plate or dinner plate. Uh, the return spring was also modified so that it fired at a slower rate of fire. This trick could also help SAS to vanish, when after firing a heavy fusillade, SAS would suddenly fall silent. So the idea would be to shoot and scoot, to fade back into green. We may move quickly for about 20 or 30 metres, then we would slow down to a slow pace and listen and start patrolling very quietly and walking out of the area. Once you can make sure you're ahead of the game, you remain unpredictable in the eyes of the enemy and you get into their decision cycle. They're wondering what you're going to do next. And the trick is allow them to overestimate your capability allow them to underestimate your capability, but always protect your actual capability. The VC called the mysterious SAS Marung, the Phantoms of the Jungle, and offered a reward for an SAS soldier, dead or alive. We were not afraid of the American GIs, Australian infantry or South Vietnamese troops, or helicopter gunships or enemy artillery, or sudden airstrikes or even B-52 bombing. But we hated the Australian SAS Rangers because they made comrades disappear very suddenly. SAS patrols also used psychological warfare tactics to undermine VC morale, especially in the deep VC jungle sanctuaries. Patrols would penetrate VC camps and pin SAS calling cards or the dreaded ace of spades to trees. They would plant flares in VC camps as targets, time to guide a dawn bombing run. Exploiting the Buddhist belief that the dead should lie face upwards to free their spirits, some SAS patrols unsettled the VC after an ambush by turning their dead face down. SAS even infiltrated active VC camps. We decided to go in with the whole patrol and stay inside. On the second day, you wouldn't believe it, we're camped inside the five of us and a bloke came out to chop a tree down. And as he's chopping the tree down, it was obvious that it was gonna fall on the patrol. <laughs> and he's chopping this tree. And I can remember the, the scout saying, because he had a silent sterling, we'll get rid of him, we'll get rid of him, because he's gonna chop the tree down on top of us and then we're gonna be in trouble. And we had to get out of there. Came back in and uh, we got rid of the camp. Uh, patrolling in the dry season in Vietnam was particularly uh, arduous and uh, it was very difficult to keep up the water supply. So uh, what we decided to do was to adopt a local habit of uh, having what we used to call park time. Park time was an area, a time during the day where we would stop and listen. Normally the hottest part of the day, about 11 o'clock till after midday. Uh, the local people observed in the villages, but also the VC did as well. Um, they are well aware that uh, running around in the middle of the day consumed more, more water, which was scarce, and also was very, very noisy and uh, made them more vulnerable. So uh, that couple of hours in the middle of the day was uh, fairly quiet, but we could also gather intelligence there by, by listening. It was particularly prevalent in the dry season where the ground underfoot would be very crispy and a term we used to, to call it was the Kellogg's cornflakes. That's what it sounded like walking on, it was crunching. But it was very difficult in the middle of the day and often the guys would uh, get pretty sleepy so we uh, allowed at least two of the five to read at any one time and uh, I used to do the same thing. I was studying uh, at that particular uh, time and I was trying to uh, read Macbeth, so I used to take it out in the jungle, so there wouldn't be any distractions. Quite a few of the chaps were quite convinced it was the ultimate pornography book, and they're always trying to uh, borrow it from me. A soldier could be wet for a fortnight from rain or perspiration. Underwear was a no-no. Even boxer shorts could be a problem. Instead, several pairs of pantyhose kept out the cold and the leeches. 
Uh, one would never take their boots off because you never knew uh, in Vietnam you could be jumped at any stage. Uh, it was a lot better to carry a, a bladder down the shirt uh, because of the noise from water bottles in the, in the jungle. Uh, things like uh, carrying machetes and big knives were hopeless over there, uh, where a pair of secateurs was a hell of a lot better. All of us had a wrist compass. I carried possibly in excess of 200 um, rounds. Uh, on the weapon I had a 30 round magazine. Um, we had Claymore mines, carried two knives, I carried a, an M16 bayonet. We had a marker panel to signal the chopper. So the chopper, if they passed over, they could see this colour. We had um, mirrors, a uh, signalling mirror. You'd sight the helicopter through the, through the little circle in the middle and you'd flick it so they could get a reflection. Unlike conventional infantry, SAS patrols were free to choose their own weapons. I carried a, an armour light for the majority of the tour with a uh, under and over XM203 or an XM148 40mm bomb launcher underneath it. But the main weapons that we used were the SLR and the M16, all modified by the SAS armour. The other weapon that I carried occasionally was a, a silent Sterling submachine gun, which is a 9mm uh, British submachine gun. The silent Sterling was used uh, primarily for a single target. Uh, so that if someone walked through uh, an ambush that we'd laid in the killing ground, uh, we could use it without compromising our position um, and uh, still stay into the ambush until a bigger target came through, i.e. three or four more soldiers. Sometimes the VC tailed an SAS patrol to learn SAS tactics. But this often failed as no two SAS patrols had the same tactical pattern. Before stopping for the night, a patrol would circle back on its track to ambush any VC that were following it. At night, they crept into the thickest bamboo or jungle to snatch sleep in turns, then slip away before dawn. And the body odor at the end of the operation was quite extraordinary. You knew how much you stunk was how far away when we went back to our base people threw your pack of cigarettes from. The vital lifeline of SAS patrols was their radios. Patrol signalers were taught radio operation and antenna theory by 152 Signal Squadron SAS. 152 Signal Squadron has gone away with every commitment that SAS ever made. Uh, and sometimes twice as often as the Sabre squadrons, making it the most experienced squadron within the regiment. SAS signalers used Morse code with one-time code pads. Because each unique cipher was used only once, SAS codes couldn't be broken. The one-time code pad is regarded as the holy grail of cryptography. SAS reports of VC were always very thorough. Observe 47 VC in groups moving west on track. North Vietnamese soldier in pressed khaki uniform with full webbing equipment. One French submachine gun, two Thompson submachine guns, one wireless. Light fire team called and engaged the enemy. Most SAS patrols depended on the helicopters of 9 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force. At first, these helicopters were unarmed. This made SAS operations very risky. So the pilots modified their own gunships, but without first asking their masters in Canberra. Had we asked permission to develop a gunship, the answer would come back, no, you can't, because the aircraft is incapable of being a gunship. In fact, the US Army told us our aircraft was incapable of being a gunship. But after nine months of creative effort and scavenging from the Americans, success. Nine Squadron had its own gunships, the Bush Rangers, with rocket pods, multi-barreled miniguns, and M60 machine guns on each side. To insert a SAS patrol, we would use five aircraft. The SAS patrol would be on one aircraft. 
There would be a command aircraft, there would be a spare aircraft, and there'd be a pair of gunships. The troops boarding the helicopter, and they would go in a, in a helicopter called the Slick Ship. The helicopter would just fall out of the sky to treetop level. You would just fly treetop level, sometimes hitting the tops of the trees and ripping your greens if you were sitting in the door with your feet hanging out. It was the wildest ride of your life. The hair stood up on the back of your neck. It was better than anything you'll ever find at Wonder World or Disneyland or anywhere else. What a ride, just fantastic. To move out onto those skids and just run into the bush and you're running into a barrier. Here we were being dropped off in the middle of nowhere in enemy territory and running into a scrub line. Our relationship with SAS was very close. If you pull them out during a hot extraction, they wouldn't come on board the aircraft one at a time and sit down and roll a smoke and do up their seat belts. They would throw themselves on the floor of the aircraft, poke their guns out the side and add to the suppressive fire that the aircraft might be laying down itself. So I jumped behind his twin M60s and looking down I could still see my mates back to back by this time. And I shot a nice arc of fire around them, uh, very nice. I felt that it was good covering fire anyhow. The crew chief came sort of over me and he said to me, did you get any bastard? And I said, well, uh, I don't know because I mainly shot cover for my mates down below. And he said, because you used all my bullets. <laughs> but the 9th Squadron, they're a fantastic mob of people. When we prayed at night, we prayed to them first, then God. Because we reckon they did more good for us. <laughs> Everyone was religious. <laughs> On one patrol in uh, May 1969, southwest of the Courtney Rubber, my patrol was surrounded. We had enemy that I could actually see to the north, to the south, and to the west. And I was pretty sure they were in the thick country to the east of us. Uh, we waited there for about three hours, and finally, as the sun was going down, I got a call, uh, the bush ranger was on their way in, that was the Australian light fire team. I asked him to put rockets 20 metres to the north and 20 metres to the south of us. After the rockets came in, uh, a lone helicopter came across the top of the trees and dropped four ropes to us. Uh, both door gunners were firing, we were firing. We hooked onto the ropes uh, and we came out and there was tracer absolutely going everywhere. We could see the enemy firing at us as we were pulled up through the trees. And I've got to say that my patrol owes its life to that very gallant pilot in Nine Squadron. Squadron and Lady Luck saved many SAS teams from certain death. Some troopers felt that a well-armed SAS patrol could take on the whole world. And as 1967 ended, SAS were winning their guerrilla war against the VC. But at this time, the Viet Cong High Command was preparing a very violent New Year's surprise party for America and her allies. In early 1968, on the Tet Lunar New Year holiday, with half of the South Vietnamese army on leave, the Viet Cong suddenly attacked in force across South Vietnam. Until now, American television had been portraying the Vietnam War as a success. But in fact, American and South Vietnamese forces were failing badly against the formidable Viet Cong guerrillas. The VC now aimed for the knockout punch, stepping up from guerrilla warfare to Mao's third revolutionary phase, open battle. But for the VC, the huge Tet Offensive was disastrous. 
exposed for the first time to massive American firepower, the Viet Cong lost thousands killed. They withdrew in costly defeat. Really, the Allies won the Tet. They won Tet. They, uh, the Viet Cong were virtually expended. Um, it was a gamble that, they, that didn't pay off for them, but the media won the battle for them. Awful sick of here. I'll be so glad to go home. You think it's worth it? Yeah, I, I don't know. They, they say we're fighting for something. I don't know. Media coverage of Tet deeply shocked Americans. This Saigon police chief appears utterly brutal. But viewers weren't told that the VC had just butchered his close friend's wife and children. Such decontextualised images in this first televised war in history eroded public support for the war. This decisive semiotic defeat of America by its own media transformed public opinion. Once believing the war was all but won, they now saw it as all but lost. The SAS squadron in Nui Dat was well aware that Tet had eaten away Allied morale and that back in Australia, the politics of failure and futility were taking control of the war. The morale within the Australian Army as a whole at that time was still good, but it was they were certainly looking at the Americans and it was bad. Uh, the, the United States Army, I think it was been said that the United States entered Vietnam with a good army and came out of it with a bad one. Certainly the, the anti-war protest movement had picked up both in the US, we'd had suffered Kent State, we had mass protests back here in Australia. The anti-war protesters rejected the tradition that a nation at war should stand by its soldiers. The trade unions um, were uh, very pro-communist uh, in, in, in the Vietnam era there. There was a lot of anger for serving members uh, that were in Vietnam. Um, the, the trade unions uh, held up our mail. There were all sorts of um, undesirable um, tricks being played. Uh, I had a lady friend back in Australia and uh, she was confronted by uh, someone disguising themselves or masquerading as, a, as an army officer. Uh, knocked on her door and uh, advised her that I'd been killed in action. Uh, she then wrote a letter to, to me and uh, it was rather a, a spooky letter because it was written as if I was dead. And uh, when I'd received the letter, uh, obviously that was uh, uh, very disturbing, quite soul destroying. After Tet, American commitment to Vietnam began to wane. SAS faced a fiercer, more confident enemy in Phuc Thuy. SAS patrols were often hotly pursued as the VC tigerishly followed up every skirmish. The VC began to anticipate SAS tactics, particularly helicopter insertions. Often the VC used to put an old man, a woman, a young teenage boy or whatever out to act as sentries on these LZs to pick up the infiltration of an SAS patrol. This forced SAS into many more hot extractions where patrols would have to call for rescue after only a few minutes on the ground. A huge cost in effort and expensive flying hours. So SAS tried deception. They would leapfrog their helicopter to several landing zones trying to confuse VC sentries. SAS also used fake extractions. The patrol would leap onto the helicopter, close the door, then jump out the other side. But the VC were not an enemy that was easily fooled. SAS patrolled without let up, reporting many VC units using the jungle tracks. But too often, 
the task force failed to take follow-up action. Yeah, we used to suffer fairly heavily from the, the battalions so, saying, oh, bum drum SAS, because they'd be deployed to find what we'd found. And of course, the time between reporting and their deploying to find it could be anything up to three months. Well, the enemy hasn't stayed around for that amount of time. He's moved on. He was always a fluid enemy. Although the VC were cunning fighters, they relied heavily on using tracks. SAS ambushed these tracks, and the VC lost many troops and vital documents. And it didn't matter if we put uh, ambushes on uh, to tracks or artillery strikes or air strikes, they would, within weeks, uh, be back on using that track as their main line of communication. As the 1960s closed, the communists were winning in Vietnam. SAS could fight the VC, but not the growing disillusionment among the Allies. As Vietnam deteriorated, SAS was about to undergo the most severe test yet of its morale and integrity. <laughs> 